Okay, so I'd like to thank Stephen for inviting me to this really um, fascinating symposium summer school with different points of view. Um, really appreciate it, I'm enjoying it here. That makes it all the more embarrassing that I have to start by apologising by saying I'm going to spend a large part of my talk discussing just how and why he's deeply confused about many things. And I had actually thought I was just going to be disagreeing with him in the second half, but listening to his talk this morning, I realised in the first half there's something that I have to mention from the start where I think it's deeply important when talking about consciousness, when studying consciousness, not to think of it as a unitary phenomenon. You're either conscious or you're not. There are many, many different kinds of consciousness. And um, the talks yesterday, which I enjoyed, I thought were really illuminating. I see them as studying many different kinds of consciousness in humans, in normal or with brain damage, in animals, in different species. Um, and I feel people studying consciousness should be looking at the many different kinds of consciousness, looking at the similarities and differences and the comparisons, rather than just thinking of the unitary, binary, conscious or not. And the topic of my talk is really how, what is, what is consciousness, and in what sense could we build a robot and make it conscious? And with the caveat that of what I've um, said just now, what kinds of consciousness could it have? How would they differ? And what similarities would there be with our consciousness, with octopus consciousness, or whatever? And I know Stephen set up this symposium with um, a strong theme of you know, the, the difference between the easy and the hard problems, and not just consciousness in the sense that the fire alarm is conscious of fire, but also the touchy-feely, subjective, this is what the fireworks looked to me last night aspect. And I'm going to go for that with robots as well. So I'm not going to try and um, duck those issues. In fact, I've got two halves to my talk. The left half is objective, um, different kinds of consciousness. And the right-hand side, the second half, is the touchy-feely, um, subjective consciousness. So to give you the first, um, I haven't got a very good, um, maybe as I zoom in and out, it's not very good um, precision there, but uh, let's hope it's okay when I get there. Um, so I'm going to go through, on the objective side, various kinds of consciousness. I'm not going to dodge the, uh, I'm going to bite the bullet of going to subjective consciousness and what I call conscious star is different from conscious one, two, three, or n. It's the subjective feeling consciousness. So that's the way I've set it up. And just to give you the, the quick overview, this is me driving home past a roadside advertisement that wasn't there yesterday. And there are various different ways in which I might be conscious of this. So. And it depends on what level of description one is describing, um, one chooses to describe how I behave and what my consciousness involves. Um, if, if I go to the doctor, the doctor can treat me at two different, at least two different levels of explanation. The doctor might treat me as a machine. I'm going to check your heartbeat. Have I got a laser on here? Yes, okay. Um, and I hope the doctor will also treat me as a human or go, or go through verbal interaction. So those are at least two different ways the, the doctor can treat me. And so when we're wondering to what extent I'm conscious of this new roadside advertisement, one way I might be conscious is, hey, I'd say to my passenger, look at that advert. That wasn't there yesterday. Verbal description. Another way, I quite often find myself driving and I get home and I completely, I wasn't aware of anything at the time, but somebody might ask me, did you notice that? And I think, oh yeah, I did notice that. Yes, there was a new Guinness advertisement there that I didn't see yesterday. And so I can report verbally, but it's later, not at the time. There's a third possibility, 
which is, I say, no, I, I don't remember seeing it. I'm sure there wasn't there, uh, an advertisement there. But perhaps later in the week, I don't normally drink Guinness, and I find myself ordering a Guinness. And, I, you know, I was, you can do statistical tests, and I was clearly influenced by this. So in some sense, I was aware, but I'm not able to verbally, in fact, I verbally report, no, I never saw it. But it influenced me, and, you know, things like blindsight come in here. So those, I'm going to be discussing all the different kinds of consciousness in humans, and perhaps applying it to what kinds of consciousness in robots. And then in the second half, I'm going to go to conscious star, which is the subjective feely, just to give you a preview. The star is the subjective side, and the dreaded qualia. <laughs> and my considered opinion is WTF, which is philosophical shorthand for what theoretical foundation. And to my mind, there's linguistic confusion there, which we can't solve Stephen's linguistic confusion. We have to try and dissolve it. We have to try and tactics to, 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 get, to sort his problems out. So I'm going to go around uh, the first half um, centered on the concept of operational tests. Operational tests for this, the, the objective tests for a consciousness in different, in humans, in animals, in robots. An objective test is where we agree on some procedure um, specified in advance, and so I can carry out the test here, somebody in Tokyo can carry out the same test, and we can't just wave our hands and say, this robot is intelligent or this robot is conscious. We have to specify what counts as passing. We have to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. We're after objectivity here. And just in case people wonder what I mean by objectivity, objective agreement, as far as I'm concerned, is intersubjective agreement by our peers. This is how science works. Actually, I think it's how everyday life works. Science is just a pushing it further. When our children learn to speak, they learn to speak our language so that they can talk the common language with intersubjective agreement with their peers. And the benefit of operational tests is, if you're trying to get a robot conscious, well, if you specify the test, you can put money on it. I bet I can do this, or I bet you can't do that. This is, of course, what the Turing did in the Turing test. And it wasn't just about intelligence. He did mention consciousness in the 1959 paper. But he deliberately set it up so that he had an operational test for what he chose to define as intelligence. And we can do the same for consciousness, for various kinds of consciousness. <coughs> and T2, the Turing test, was explicitly and knowingly set up by Turing as the verbal kind of intelligence. And you can test for different T3s, verbal plus behavioral. And again, for consciousness, since there are many different kinds of consciousness, different kinds of tests will be applicable. But Turing was a smart guy, and he evaded all the sort of philosophical hand-wavy wiffle-waffle by putting forward this Turing test that you can bet money on. And the Leubner Prize is a version of that, where money's involved. Now, I'm in the business of evolutionary robotics, um, which is trying to produce robots by saying we're not clever enough to work out what should go in their brains, so we'll pinch ideas from biology and evolve them. And I'll just give you a sort of crude overview of what goes on, and then explain why we do things a strange way. Um, so we're evolving typically pretty simple robots, Think of these as simple animals. So the context of consciousness, what's the simplest form of artificial creature that we can say has this kind of cognitive ability, that kind of cognitive ability, is conscious in this form or that form. And we typically evolve, artificially evolve, crude neural networks, and we're unashamed 
They're caricatures of real neurons. I would prefer not to call them neural networks myself. But, you know, these are, these are simplifications. These are, if you like, just one way of evolving machinery in the brain. And this is an, uh, an artificially evolved um, brain for a particular robot with sensors on the left and interneurons here and some motor outputs on the right, just to give you a feel. Um, there's a nematode worm of three, with 300 neurons. Maybe in a thousand years or time or so, we can artificially evolve things of that sophistication. We're at the real simple end of the scale. So how do we do it? Just a quick overview. Um, we, we do the evolutionary generations here, where here's a robot, and we sometimes deal in simulations, sometimes we're evolving real robots. But the brains, in quotation marks, are typically running on a computer, though they may be implemented in hardware. Um, and we have a evolution requires, Darwinian evolution requires a population. And we start off, we have a population of artificial DNA, could be noughts and ones. And we initialize that at random. And the, that DNA specifies the wiring of the brain, if you like. And sometimes it specifies the bodily morphology, the sensors, the motors, whatever. Sometimes we fix the body and we're just evolving the brain. Sometimes we're evolving both. And we have a population of these. So we might have 100. I've only got four there. but. We might have a hundred of these. And we test all of them, one at a time, on the task. Can it distinguish a triangle from a square or some simple-minded cognitive task? And they've all got random brains, so mostly pathetically. One or two do slightly less pathetically than others. So there's a kind of differential fitness at this task. We kill off the, the worst ones. The higher scoring ones get to mate in procreate in... Um, robot sex of a slightly boring kind. We just take their genotypes and mix and match so the DNA goes through to the next generation. And it's just mindless Darwinian evolution. Um, and that's really the, the sort of caricature details. But that covers what's going on. And clearly, getting back to the operational test business, we're evolving these things according to fitness criteria which we can objectively test. So that's where it fits into this core notion of operational tests. And why, would, why do we do this? Well, there are different reasons. Dario Floriano is giving a talk later this morning where he'll be giving his own reasons, which are sometimes similar, sometimes different from mine. My reasons are often using these as if you like, thought experiments, philosophical thought experiments, but not just on paper, but actually you have to walk the walk as well as talk the talk, getting things to work in practice. So I call it philosophy of mind with a screwdriver sometimes. And one of the, sort, well, the sorts of things you can do is pose questions such as, if you evolve a robot to do something, does it really want to do that? In what sense does it want to do that? People doing artificial intelligence typically get robots to do something by writing a program, putting a bit of code that expresses the programmer's wishes, want to go to the door. Um, so the program inserts his eye on the brain. This doesn't happen the way we do it. I mean, the final cause, the teleological reason why we finish up with robots that do the task we want them to do, was that they're descended from a long line of ancestors that did it better than their brothers and sisters who got killed off. And we call it artificial evolution. It's more like a farmer's breeding cows, actually, in that we're directing, we're directing the evolution towards our aims and goals. But to give a, a sort of flavor, here's an example from our group, Matt Quinn, Evolving, it was done in simulation, and then it was actually done on real robots as well. Um, evolving robots, in this case, they had to communicate with each other with nothing except their movements. And the way it was set up was they have very short range infrared sensors. They can only detect things about five centimeters away. 
and they were evolved as a clonal... This is one individual, if you like, or, or three clones of a single genotype. And the fitness function was, how far would they go across the room as a team? And to go as a team, because of their senses, the only way of doing that was to would be to have a leader and two followers. There was no other way. But we set the fitness function, how far did they go as a team? And this necessarily required them to, in quotation marks, choose amongst themselves who was going to be the leader, because their initial eyes dropped at random, and who's going to be the follower. And we didn't give them speech, we didn't give them symbols, we didn't give them anything. And they evolved so as to use a communicative sort of little twirl that after the fact we could try and analyse what was going on, but they succeeded in doing that. And clearly by our um, operational tests, they had succeeded in this communication uh, task. And um, so that's the kind of uh, philosophy of mind of the screwdriver stuff that uh, I'm personally interested in doing. And to my mind, we finish up with robots that really want to communicate, that really want to go to the door. It's not, it's not an artifact of... Um, so just a quick side, um, side swipe. Um, cognition is typically thought of, hey, there's the brain inside and there's the world outside. And the body that is not even mentioned on this diagram is a means of communicating between, you know, sensing and motor, motor action. It's communicating with the world and the inside brain. So just as an aside, that's not actually the way I think of it at all. I don't think cognition is in the brain at all, nor is consciousness. I think it's actually foolish to try and talk about where these are. It's a, it's a linguistic confusion, which is what we're going to come to in the second half. If you foolishly insist on trying to locate it, It'd be best to put it in the whole sensory motor loop. Don't look for cognition or, or consciousness in the brain. So let's move to uh, evolution robotics work by Randy Beer on categorical perception. And this is entirely in simulation. But he had um, simple, this is a simple robot that can move left and right. This is the robot. And it has uh, seven sensors, which are, if you like, vision-type sensors that just detect how far away something is. And in its world, it can only move left and right, and objects fall from the sky, either round ones or diamond-shaped ones. And the task that these are evolved to do is to detect with their sensors whether that's a circle or a diamond, and to, I forget which way around it is, escape the diamond and catch the circle, I think it is. And their brains look like this. They have seven sensory neurons, some engine neurons, and two motors to move left and right. And they'll catch the falling circle. If you, if you, this is a time diagram. It's turned on its side, if you like, relative to the position of the, cir of the robot compared to where the circle came down. There should be a naught there. Um, so if you take this, this is when the robot is way off to the right-hand side when the circle comes from the sky. And you can see the robot moves, scans across, scans, and finishes up sitting in the center, if it's a circle. Whereas if it's a diamond, the robot scans across and disappears off. Okay? And this is evolved. This is the uh, successfully evolved ones. This is their behavior with different objects falling from the sky. And clearly they can categorize between circles and diamonds. You can ask questions like, when, so in some sense they're conscious or they're aware, maybe not a touchy-feely sense, but in some sense they're aware of what is falling from the sky. And you can ask, when were they aware? How do you ask that? Well, when have they committed themselves to catching or moving away? You can test that by letting the, the circle fall so far and then switching it for the diamond and seeing if it's already committed itself to deciding it's one, then um, it'll, it won't be phased by the change of the shape. And you can test. You can do experimental tests. And what you find is that the decision point isn't a sort of binary decision that's made somewhere. 
for a period of time, um, there's uncertainty. In other words, if you switch at time 20, it will, it will stick with what it's committed to. If you switch at time 22, it will change its mind. The decision made isn't a binary decision, or at least there's a long period of time when there's um, indecision, if you like. So the decision is not made at a unique point of time. And this is all used uh, doing uh, operational tests. Now with that robot example in mind, I'm going to try a little simplified psychophysical experiment on you. So watch the screen, and it's a bit amateur this, but I'm just going to go through. <coughs> okay, did you notice some numbers? Can you remember, how many of the numbers can you remember? Okay. In an ideal world, I would have had a less homemade setup. And if I did it for about 150 milliseconds, you'd have remembered three numbers. Okay? Different people would have remembered three. Okay? So, but if, you, if that had happened, you were aware and conscious of the three numbers, and you were probably aware in a lesser sense that there were other numbers, but you weren't conscious what they were. Okay. I had to, when were you aware of those three numbers? You're tempted to say, well, at this point in time, I saw the three, and I kind of half or didn't properly see the other six. Actually, if at this stage, and if I primed you with all hands and said there's going to be an audio tone a little bit later, there's either going to be a high, low, or media, high medium or low audio tone, and you have to recall, try and recall the top, middle, or bottom line, typically you will remember three from the correct line. So in some sense, you are aware of all nine of them, or, or any line of three of them, if you do it one way, and yet the other way you are convinced that you only saw three of them. So this sort of fits in with the hey, there are many different kinds of consciousness. There's the ones you can report at the time, ones you can report later. I refer you back to the sort of roadside car uh, adversity experiment. And you can apply those operational tests to humans, to animals, and to robots, and get different kinds of consciousness, conscious awareness. We saw it in the robots there. Um, looking at the time, well, okay. Um, I'll just mention here that Okay, we can, the doctor can look at people at two different levels of description, as a human with a mind or as a machine with a mechanism. We can look at robots as making a decision as to catch or avoid the falling object, and then we're treating them as a, uh, as a, as a whole person, I mean robot person, as a whole complete agent, or we can look at the robots and look at the micro-mechanisms of what was going on in the, in the brain, of the artificial brain of the robot. And these are different causal stories. And if we confuse these different causal stories and try and attribute causes at one level of description and feed them through to the other, whichever way, we're basically recipe for disaster. We're looking for a pineal gland. This is, and this is what people do all the time, I'm afraid. So you shouldn't confuse um, different kinds, different levels of description. So that's the first half. The takeaway lesson is there are many different causal stories that you can give. There are many different kinds of consciousness of humans, animals, and machines that we can discuss and apply operational tests to. And incidentally, even within a single such story, finding a decision point is surprisingly interesting. So, in terms of making conscious robots that pass operational tests, we can do it. We have done it in some of these senses of the consciousness, awareness of categories, etc. It's not yet the touchy-feely subjective stuff. So the question arises, are these zombies? You know, if they're successful, are they just zombies? So let's go to the touchy-feely, uh, the subjective side.
How am I doing for time? Um, okay. So, looking at some of the phrases expressed on the subjective hard side, um, I've got a quote here from Stephen Harnad. It's surely true that the brain causes both doing and feeling, and I think feeling here, he's referring to the touchy-feely side. Um, and hence also meaning somehow, which to my mind is intersecting two completely different causal chains. But I notice here he's talking about the brain causing feeling. So it's like the body story influencing the mind story. But elsewhere, he talks about the causal role of feeling, in other words, the mind influencing the body. I think he's deeply confused about these different causal chains, and he's, doing the, the, he's looking for the pineal gland, basically. Um, this talk of what causal role does the feeling take, this is trying to find what role a cause in one mental level of description story, how that affects something in a completely different brain level, causal explanation, and vice versa. Um, so I believe this is linguistic confusion. And even if we go back to the, um, the beer robot example, we saw then that we could actually present two different narrative stories about what was going on. We could give a whole agent story about the robot recognizing the diamond because as observers we can see that the diamond comes down, it goes away. Therefore, we say it's recognized it. We can also do a different, you know, a, the, the, the doctor has different levels of description. We can also go and look into the brain, and since it's an artificially evolved robot, we have absolute access to everything going on in the brain. And we might have this kind of story, that, okay, the sensory input caused something to trigger and went into a different basin of attraction or whatever. Um, but these are two different stories at two different levels, and you should not mix these stories, and that's the, the uh, mistake that's being made all the time. It's just confused, and particularly when we move to subjective feelings, the touchy-feely stuff, the temptation is to treat subjective feelings as if they are objective things. And the whole point about subjective feelings stuff is that they are not objects. We are misled by the grammar that I can say the chair is on the table or the table is on the chair and they are both objects. But if I say I see the object, I see the chair, the I and the chair we're tempted to say they're the same sort of thing but one's a subject in a subjective sense, the other's an object and we get linguistic confusions lead us to all sorts of problems. So here's an example. Try and get the message over. Definition of a horse. Forget all the long words, let's concentrate on the with one tail. Okay? Happy? One horse has one more tail than no horse. Check it out. One horse, one tail, that side. No horse, no tails on that side. Anybody disagree? Nope. No horse has two tails. I mean, we know that both through experience and actually the way I defined it. A horse has one tail, right? Anybody disagree? You've agreed with both statements, and the logical conclusion is that one horse has three tails. So, um, some of you may spot the logical flaw in there. <laughs> some of you possibly Stephen, might say, well, I'm worried about this. There's something that feels wrong, but I bind the logic. So these three horse tails, they exist, though I'm worried about them. I think that's what's going on over there. <laughs> um, language causes mistakes. Linguistic confusion. Wittgenstein, private language argument. So, 
my subjective touchy-feely feelings that I can experience and they're private to me. So Wittgenstein suggested, you know, it's a bit like I've got my box with perhaps there's a beetle in it, but only I'm showing it, I shouldn't really be allowed to show it to you here, because actually only I'm allowed to open the box, only I can experience these touchy-feely subjective feelings. And so then the question comes, well, how can we talk about this? Because I've got my private box with my touchy subjective feelings in there, and you've all got your own boxes. And how can we talk about them in a public shared language that, at the scientific level, even at the everyday level, comes about through intersubjective agreement? How could children have learnt to talk about subjective experiences if everything is tucked away in a private box? So the very attempt to talk about things that cannot be shared publicly in this way is just doomed to failure. So that's the Wittgenstein private language argument. Let's try another one. Here's some cognitive creatures. Conscious in some senses, not very much conscious in other senses. So from the left, here's a pretty primitive robot that's aware of some things in some sense of the word, a nematode worm, a sunflower that you can train, a lab rat, a uh, chimpanzee, a human in a test. Okay. We can study their cognition. We can study their consciousness. And here we are studying it, right? We're outside the box looking in. And that's us, and you can tell we're serious people. We've got white lab coats. We don't smile. The guy on the right's just done it for the camera. And we're godlike creatures looking from outside. Hmm. The whole point about cognition and consciousness is we're not outside the box. We're inside. That's what's interesting. That's what's challenging. And if you forget that we're inside, you run into all sorts of confusions. One last one. Um, yeah. So here is, I think, how quite a lot of people set things up for the problem of where consciousness or mind comes from. Here's a timeline. So this is the planet Earth four billion years ago. And there was nothing, no living creatures on there, nothing conscious. There was just physics then. In fact, Stephen had a, a slide with, I forget, there were four things on there. But basically, there was just, this is just physics. And then at some stage, we can argue about when, poof, something imagined happened, and where there wasn't life, or there wasn't consciousness, particularly if you think of consciousness as a unitary phenomenon, you either have it or you don't, at some stage, poof, that happened. Um, and that's the mystery that worries so many people. How, from something completely lifeless, physics, how can touchy-feely subjective stuff, as one example, or just life as a whole as another example, how, well, let's stick to the touchy-feely stuff, actually. How can that arise? There's a mystery there. And if we're trying to build robots that are more than zombies, that don't just behave in the way that fire alarms behave in fire, they don't just react and pass those kind of operation tests, but have this touchy-feely stuff, we have to understand what happened, that magic there, and as roboticists, we have to try and recreate that kind of magic in our robots. I think the way that picture is set up has brought you into the wrong conclusion. So, Dan Dennett, during his talk, said he was a materialist. I'm a materialist. I probably buy into all the materialist assumptions Dan Dennett Dan had. Stephen said he's a monist. I'm probably a monist. I'll probably buy into all the assumptions that he has there. So we should be in total agreement, except there's a sort of subtle difference that 
When I say I'm a materialist, what I really mean is I buy into the 21st century reasonably scientific and philosophically literate materialist or monistic story and in terms of intersubjective agreement I expect to get quite a lot of agreement here on that story but it's a human story it's our story of what went on physics this notion that 15 million years ago there was 15 billion years ago sorry there was a lifeless there's the Big Bang. This is a, a human story trying to understand our world. We're not outside the world. We're part of it. We have to try and explain it. And we have to try and explain it to our peers. If you were a bunch of octopi, and I was an octopus giving this talk, I'd be giving a very different talk because you'd have different assumptions. I'd be showing a lot more crabs on the screen for a start. <laughs> so, inevitably, I have to... We have to talk in our shared experience, our shared 21st century human experience. We're not outside the world. And the way this story is set up tries to avoid that basic truth. And these are all linguistic confusions that basically are a recipe for disaster and should be avoided. So I summarise the first half takeaway lesson was there are many different causal stories, different narratives. If you're interested in studying consciousness, don't try and study unitary consciousness. Try and study the many different ways in which a human can be conscious. A normal human, a brain damaged human, somebody under stress, blind sight, etc. Study animal consciousness, consciousnesses. Look at the differences and similarities with humans, to what extent the extent of the similarities, we can empathise with them. Um, so even the single such story, narrative story, um, there are all sorts of subtle complications. Don't confuse different levels of description. Zombies or not zombies, this is looking at the subjective stuff. Well, the takeaway lesson from the sec second half is it's simply foolish. It's linguistic confusions to treat the subjective as if it were objective. And our language tries to make us that try to make us make that mistake it's three horses with three tails all the way through objective is intersubjective agreement between our within our language community our, our cultural community there's no private language and above all we're not outside the system we can't try and understand cognition entirely as if we're godlike creatures outside the interesting thing is we are part of the system we're trying to understand so, in terms of the easy, hard problems, the so-called easy problems are the first half of the talk, the operationally test, objectively testable criteria. They're kind of, they're not in principle problems. We can evolve robots with different levels of consciousness. Of course, it'll get more interesting when they're, they become less alien and more like humans. But in principle, there are no problems. The so-called hard problems, the touchy-feely subjectivity, also, well, they present no problems at all. We don't even need to worry about them. This is just the result of linguistic confusion. And I shall finish there. Thank you.